Thank you very much, to Jose. Um, now, our next presenter, Mr. Uh, Sanjay Fiketi, who is the country manager, executive director of uh, Olam um, Agro India Limited, which is 100% subsidiary of uh, Olam International. Um, Olam, um, you all know, is listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange, um, one of the 20 largest stocks in terms of market utilization on the exchange. Um, Sanjay heads the Indian business um, of Olam um, and um, he's been with the company since 2000 and uh, in his current position since 2004. Uh, he's a member of uh, Olam's Global Management Committee, um, which comprises all the product of tools, um, and uh, he's the senior country head of the group. Um, in a career spanning around 28 years, he's also worked um, with various companies um, in India, like Unilever, um, Conagra, the Tata Group, and the Aisha Group and is a chartered accountant and company secretary by qualification. So <coughs> the floor is yours. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks John for that introduction. And good morning, everybody. Uh, at the very outset, I would like to thank CAI for allowing a non-cotton guy to sneak in this rather August gathering. I'm the only one, I guess, uh, who's going to talk about uh, issues not related to cotton grain. So, uh, can I have the uh, presentation, please? Okay, so I've been asked to uh, give a very quick uh, overview about uh, Indian agriculture. Uh, a uh, general overview uh, spanning across all commodities and uh, the major commodities and what's happening uh, really in uh, the Indian agricultural space. So, uh, I'll, my presentation would cover very quickly about 100 seconds on what Uran is all about. Uh, the current agricultural landscape uh, in India, uh, the agricultural trends here, what's emerging uh, as, as we speak, uh, and uh, some uh, uh, some uh, information on what's happening in the major commodities uh, in which uh, Indian agriculture is engaged. So, very quickly on Olam, uh, as uh, some of you would know that uh, it's a multi-commodity, uh, multi-geography company, uh, which is operating across the food and agri value chain. Basically, our model is uh, connecting uh, farms all over the world to uh, uh, factories, uh, food processing factories all over the world. Uh, we, uh, we, we call ourselves the brand behind the brands. We typically uh, uh, are supply chain managers for various food FMCG companies and uh, as far as cotton is concerned, uh, supply chain managers do various textile companies all over the world. We are listed on Singapore Stock Exchange. Uh, the model is basically right from farming uh, onwards into trade, logistics, processing, and uh, then very selectively in consumer products as well in certain uh, very niche geographies like West Africa. As far as India is concerned, we have been in India since 1992. We started uh, in the cashew space and now we are uh, present across a range of commodities. Uh, we run a lot of uh, cashew processing, uh, cashew and other food commodity processing operations in India. And uh, the operation is uh, spread all over the country, uh, largely in peninsular India, where some of our major commodities like cashew, coffee, spices, and uh, sugar uh, are uh, really concentrated. <coughs> Moving on to the uh, current landscape in India, India is a rather unique country as far as uh, agriculture is concerned. We have got about 600 million people, which is 45% of the country's population.
So it's a it's a very unique country from uh, the perspective of the kind of engagement which the population has with agriculture. We have got almost 600 million people who are directly uh, whose livelihood is directly dependent on uh, agriculture. Uh, a large part of the country's total land mass is actually uh, uh, involved, engaged in agriculture. We have almost 45 to 50 percent of the total land mass. Uh, which is dedicated towards uh, uh, agriculture compared to the global average which is less than 15 percent. Uh, we also have, we are also blessed with uh, a very good variety of agroclimatic zones, the kind of soils which we have, which is why we have a very diversified basket of agricultural commodities which are grown in India. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the Indian standing in various commodities is concerned. We are among the top two players in all the major commodities of the world. Uh, let's say cotton, wheat, rice, sugar, uh, livestock, uh, milk. You name any of these commodities, we are among the top two players in the country, uh, in the world, uh, if not the, uh, the largest. So this is overall, uh, this is a recipe for a lot of opportunities in the food and agri space. But obviously there are uh, constraints uh, which are there. So if you look at the major trends, the, the major issue which is today um, uh, confronting the Indian agricultural space is absolutely stagnant uh, crop yields. This is what is not leading to increase in farm productivity and incomes. The farm productivity has been growing at less than 3% uh, over the last uh, last decade or so. Then there is a constant shift in land use which is happening due to which the, the land under cultivation, the arable, uh, arable land in the country is virtually constant at about 140, 141 million hectares over the last so many years. Uh, in line with, uh, with localization of labor use, uh, farm labor availability across the country is uh, is uh, dropping. Uh, this is because the traditional uh, geographical areas for supply of labor, uh, the opportunities there are growing and migration of labor is coming down. Similarly, uh, mechanization uh, which is absolutely suited to a marginal uh, farm uh, holdings of 1 to 1.5 acres is not growing. There is lot of opportunity there but uh, but uh, the technology or the entrepreneurial effort which has to go into uh, into uh, customizing mechanization for these kind of farmlands is not happening so the combination of low labor availability and lack of uh, mechanization is an area of concern for uh, the indian agriculturists then the impact of climate change we have seen two years of el nino uh, Water availability uh, is, is a clear stress factor as far as India is concerned. Uh, rainfall pattern has been receding over the last now uh, last uh, more than 10 years. So we have been uh, 7 out of 10 years, uh, we have seen uh, rainfall which is lower than the long term average for the country. Uh, there is a uh, very low uh, Due to the huge fiscal deficit which India has been running, government stability and the focus on investment in irrigation has been pretty low. Due to which the percentage of total arable land which is under irrigation is virtually constant at uh, at around 45-46 percent. So that is uh, that is limiting the uh, ability of the farmer to improve uh, farm productivity. Uh, one bright spot in Indian agricultural space is the horticulture production. There is a clear shift which is happening there and uh, about three years back Indian horticulture production has overtaken the food grain production of the country. So this is uh, one clear bright spot and that's where a lot of opportunities in the food, uh, fruit and vegetable processing space are coming up in the country. And last but not the least, uh, as uh, GDP growth continues to be around 6 to 7 percent, uh, that natural expected shift towards processed and branded foods is happening 
uh, which is leading to uh, more uh, opportunities in the overall food processing sector. Now, very quick look at the data. Uh, I talked about the area under cultivation. Uh, the area under cultivation has been constant at around 141, uh, 140, 141 million hectares. The percentage of area which is irrigated is constant at 46, uh, 45, 46 percent. Look at the major crops. Uh, the CAGR for the last six, seven years has been virtually at uh, sub two, sub uh, sub three percent. So hardly keeping pace with uh, the domestic requirements. So the marketable surplus for exports is is virtually constant or is rather inconsistent. When you look at the horticulture space, there the growth is very clearly there and uh, that's where the opportunities are emerging for, uh, uh, for managing complete supply chain processing and logistics. This is the data uh, um, uh, on food, uh, food grain production and horticulture production. Clearly, uh, the growth rates are much higher on the horticulture side. Uh, as far as the government support for the agri uh, sector is concerned, given the high fiscal deficit which India has faced over the last uh, few years, uh, the present government has moderated the increases which they are giving to the farmers for the major crops uh, through minimum support prices. So minimum support prices have been below four. Uh, minimum uh, the increase in minimum support prices has been below uh, four percent for the major crops over the last two to three years. Now, let's look at uh, the water availability. Uh, the typical North Indian states of uh, Haryana, Delhi, Punjab, Rajasthan, they are facing acute scarcity. Peninsular India is better off. But overall, the water scarcity uh, across the country is pretty acute. Uh, if this is the hydrogeological map of uh, India. And if you look at the level of uh, uh, stress there, especially in the north uh, northwestern states, this is pretty acute. And that's where agricultural productivity might take a hit as we go along. So, uh, the need of the hour as far as the, agriculture, the Indian agricultural space is concerned is one is that we have got a very fragmented uh, land board for agricultural produce uh, that would improve uh, farm, product uh, farm productivity or uh, produce realization for the farmers. Then support for investment in farm and food technology uh, which is uh, very much required be it mechanization, be it seeds, uh, be it uh, uh, other agri inputs. Uh, this is something which is uh, which is very important uh, for India, and also investment in the rural road infrastructure, which uh, which allows freer and more efficient uh, movement of uh, goods uh, from farms to the markets, uh, and also investment in food technology related research, which would lead to more development of more processed foods, which are customized to local tastes and preferences thereby leading to uh, improved farm realizations as food, the demand from food processing industry for uh, good quality farm produce increases. Last but not least, I think uh, fiscal support for agri, uh, agri exports. Uh, Indian, uh, Indian currency has been relative to its peers, uh, been rock steady over the last, uh, over the last uh, maybe uh, two years. And this is leading to a uh, lot of uh, lack of competitiveness as far as farm exports are concerned. So, government had a good framework for uh, for extending fiscal support for farm exports, but that has been withdrawn. And the new uh, regulations which have been put in place are more in favor of high, higher value added food products. Now, India is, is still not positioned to. Uh, exploit that opportunity because of various reasons. Businesses are not ready, food technology and food processing industry is still not very de well developed. So what India needs to do is in the intervening period till the food processing industry becomes globally competitive, it needs to provide the right fiscal environment for, uh, for
for encouraging uh, farm exports or low and low value added food exports. Now, moving on to specific commodities, uh, sugar is uh, one uh, large commodity in the Indian agricultural space. Uh, we have been the, consistently the second largest uh, producer of sugar, the largest consumer of sugar, and at times the largest importer of sugar in, again, in the world. Now, uh, sugar, as uh, some of us know, is highly water intensive, and because of the climate related stress, now we are seeing early signs of a receding sugarcane crop in the country. Uh, India has had some very good years as far as production of sugar is concerned over the last 3-4 years. But now uh, it is increasingly coming under stress. And uh, we expect that over the next couple of years sugar production will go down from its peak of 28 million tons to about 25 million tons. Where India, Indian demand would be, uh, would be balanced with production. And that's where there are chances that India would turn out to be, an, uh, to be a net importer. Uh, as far as government is concerned, it is currently focused on, uh, on flushing out the huge surplus which India is uh, sitting on right now, uh, which is uh, because of uh, the large uh, uh, crops which we saw in the last 3-4 years. India, uh, India has come out with an export subsidy scheme and, uh, and uh, expectations are that these stocks will be flushed out over the next 12-18 to 18 months. Right now, parities aren't there for exports, but uh, we expect parities to return uh, as, uh, as, as uh, world prices uh, go up in line with the, uh, with the tighter balance sheet which we are witnessing uh, globally. Which are processed in India. 
then uh, moving on to spices, spices is a bright spot in India. India is virtually uh, the most uh, diversified producer of spices, the largest exporter, consumer and uh, uh, producer of spices in the world. Almost all major spices, wheat, uh, red pepper, black pepper, turmeric, coriander, any, any of these major spices are grown in India and India is the leading producer. The spices exports from India are growing year after year. It's showing actually a very healthy trend. Uh, secondly, uh, the bright spot uh, in, in uh, the spices exports is the export of processed spices. So compared to so many other crops, brand, uh, processed spices exports out of India are growing at a much faster clip than the raw commodity exports. So India, Indian corporations as well as multinationals have uh, invested in uh, processing of spices across India and uh, this is one area where we feel that, uh, that growth would be uh, pretty consistent and uh, actually uh, there has been a lot of investment uh, in farm extension services in sustainability related practices for uh, spices. So spices uh, is, is, is clearly a bright spot. So these, uh, this is uh, the overview which I have uh, for you and I have restricted myself to crops uh, which we deal in. Uh, I have not talked about some larger crops like uh, wheat and coarse cereals which, uh, which are grown in India uh, in large quantities but uh, largely to crops which uh, Oran uh, has been engaged with. So overall I feel that uh, uh, as some of these investments go into the agri space, as markets are freed up and as the Make in India or the ease of doing business campaign uh, gathers space and food processing industry grows in India, India is very well positioned to be a large processed agri products exporter just like it is becoming for yarn. Uh, it is likely to uh, be a large exporter over the next 5 to 10 years for almost all major commodities and their derivatives uh, to most of the markets in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, the presenters. Uh, we are very much uh, enriched with the presentation. I have a particular question to Joseph Sethi. So far, the Vietnam's uh, 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 is Vietnam is concerned. We are very encouraged to see the, the consumption of uh, raw cotton in Vietnam. If I put the words magic, it is not enough so for the Vietnam's development and in colonies and so on. The can you throw some light? Uh, how did it happen? Within a short span of time, they become the one of the giant in cotton consumption. Thank you. Hello? 
That's a good question. Um, I will go back to my experience uh, in uh, coffee. In 1991, uh, Vietnam produced, uh, in coffee, uh, instead of bales, we talk about uh, bags of 60 kilos. Uh, uh, in 1990, 91, uh, Vietnam produced about 50,000 uh, bags of coffee. Today, it produces about, I don't know, somewhere around the 28 to 30 million bags per year and is the second largest coffee producer in the world. This, I think, shows a bit that the dynamism of uh, Vietnamese society, agriculture in particular. I don't think uh, uh, we, uh, in cotton, uh, we run the threat uh, that uh, happened uh, in coffee because of uh, more of a climatic uh, uh, considerations that uh, make it difficult uh, to grow cotton uh, in uh, Vietnam. But, Excuse me. It's a very dynamic society, a very hard-working society. Uh, maybe it's my uh, Latin background, let's say. Uh, uh, when in the times I have visited Vietnam, I, I, I can tell you, I, I get tired of just looking at them uh, working. Uh, they are very hard-working people, and uh, I think that is how they have uh, constructed uh, their, uh, their growth uh, in uh, uh, agriculture and in processing also. They uh, benefit from uh, low wage levels, but this really doesn't explain uh, everything that happens uh, there. Uh, and uh, over time, uh, their wage levels are starting to rise. They're benefiting uh, today from a lot of uh, transfer of industries uh, from places like uh, China where uh, the uh, labor costs have risen even further. Uh, they are benefiting temporarily from this uh, transfer, uh, but over time uh, even their wages will rise and uh, uh, they uh, will become, let's say, less competitive and maybe uh, uh, less uh, dynamic. But uh, as I said, I, I tip my hat to them. Uh, the Vietnamese are uh, very hard workers and uh, there is something that uh, we should all uh, look at and examine with great care uh, how they uh, got where they are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No matter what the oil prices, there is no, uh, uh, at the moment, 
much strain from production of polyester. I have often uh, thought to myself, other, with respect to our friends from China, are the Chinese cleverer than we think they are? You know, in, in the sense that the Chinese government uh, had a policy at one stage of trying to be self-sufficient in cotton, and then it realized it couldn't do that, so it wanted to be self-sufficient in cotton to be able to cover domestic consumption of cotton. In other words, produce enough to clear themselves be. That seems to be a distant ambition now. Did they realize that they could do that with polyester a long time ago and therefore move their policy to encourage polyester production? And I, I think that we're reaping the consequences of Chinese policy. I think, I think that's the fundamental issue that, that's affecting all of us today. So my answer to, you, to your question is yes, polyester prices provide a cap on where cotton prices can go, and that means that it restricts farmers' ambitions to earn more money from producing cotton. Next question. My question is something similar to the gentleman. The polyester and the cotton, what is the uh, ratio with each other? The polyester goes down 10 percent, and what is the ratio of the cotton to go down? With your experience, because it makes a big difference to all cotton people. We have polyester going down, you rightly said, crude is going down. So, how much it can affect cotton in coming years? Um, as regards, I think you're talking about market shares. Uh, ICAC, so I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Sete on. on, on, on shares that there's a share of Mame Fibers uh, uh, against cotton. Clearly we all know that Mame Fibers and polyester in particular have gone up and cotton has gone down. I don't have those statistics in my head because if I say ICAC can buy a part of that data. Um, uh, but as I, as I said in the previous answer, it's, it's, it's not an optimistic outlook in terms of the composition from, from the polyester, not just staple fiber, but, but filaments and the technical aspects of being able to use polyester in different ways, um, the, the uh, innovation, the novelty, uh, being able to produce different flashes, different fi uh, fabrics that, that have different performance levels. Um, and the Mammy Fibers industry is very successful at promoting that. Uh, Unfortunately, it's not as successful in defending its position or promoting its position. There is no one organization that is acting in a global capacity to, to, to do that, even though I know there's the, uh, there is an organization like under ICAC which, which is mandated to do that to some extent, but but it's a very limited scope as far as I'm aware. Mr. Sethi may have other comments on that. Thank you. Uh, according to our numbers today, uh, cotton uh, occupies about 28% uh, share of the world fiber market. Uh, this has been, uh, uh, this was relatively stable, about 50% for a long time, uh, and then from 1990 onwards uh, started uh, falling uh, steadily. Uh, this fall uh, was accelerated in recent years uh, by uh, the high absolute price levels of uh, cotton. Um, I, I think uh, I, uh, I differ maybe from some other analysts uh, uh, in terms of this emphasis on, on the ratio of uh, 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 the, the prices of cotton and uh, uh, polyester, in that I do believe that the absolute level is also important. Now, uh, when we're talking about a, a ratio of, I don't know, uh, polyester of 60% uh, uh, of, of uh, cotton prices, when uh, cotton prices are above uh, a dollar, uh, per pound, that is a lot different uh, than uh, the same ratio uh, when we are uh, at today's price level. So 
uh, I, uh, um, I'm, like I said, uh, a bit more uh, optimistic than uh, many uh, analysts in this uh, sense. So, uh, the absolute levels of uh, uh, prices that we're seeing in cotton today are pretty uh, attractive, I think, uh, in the, in the for, for the industry. But uh, polyester, of course, is uh, much cheaper, uh, and uh, we we cannot be complacent about this. I think uh, I try to, to uh, convey this uh, in my presentation. So uh, we we should be complacent about the uh, demand situation for cotton. But uh, I think at the current price levels, uh, this will help. Uh, stem a little this long-term decline. Uh, this is a long-term trend. Uh, we expect it to continue. The, the relative share of cotton to other finals uh, will continue to fall, but uh, at a slower rate uh, in, in the next few years. Thank you. We'll take one last question. Hello, uh, my question is to Mr. Butler. Uh, here, Mr. Butler. Uh, this is regarding the, the Trans Pacific agreements that are you know, coming into place, which is majorly a yarn forward rule. Do you see a trade happening due to this Trans Pacific agreements? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I'm not sure if it's a simple answer to it, but it's a very complicated issue as to how all these relationships work out. Um, but, but certainly countries that are in the TPP will know to benefit so that we should see expansion in those, the, those countries. So uh, you know, that, 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 that favours them and, 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 and favours direct investment, foreign direct investments in those countries specifically. Um, because it will give access to, to this huge consumer market. Um, so in a broad sense of answer, yes, but the specific details, I think we'd have to go through each country by country. It would probably take too long for us to do that right now. Um, so in the broad answer, yes, you identify an issue. So is Vietnam is also an example of that? Maybe we are seeing a shift of you know major spinning mills growing over there and you know, a lot of cotton not getting imported into Vietnam. Probably it's also you know a part of that that Vietnam is growing so so extensively. Well, I think so. If you look at the imports of cotton into Vietnam, I think it's something like sixty-six percent or seventy percent is uh, are imports by foreign direct invested mills. Um, so the, the, the Vietnam has been seen as a, a, not not only for the reasons which the said is quite about low labour costs and cheap energy costs and what have you, but also because uh, it's the place to be if you have restrictions on raw cotton imports in your own country, as China does, and if you want to be part of the agreements that your country is not going to be part of, the obvious answer is to go where you can have access to, so that's Vietnam, which is why, in my view, the industry is expanding there so rapidly. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and uh, that will be the end of uh, this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. A big thank you to all the speakers as Steve Yes, I think the session was very interesting and everybody enjoyed it. So once again, can we have a huge round of applause for all the speakers? <laughs>